Today, as we come to the table, he hasn't given up. And what that means is now he's going to shift tactics. His first tactic is do everything I can to get them from coming to Christ. Stop that from happening. Okay, they did it. Too late. What's plan number two? All right, I can't stop them from coming to Christ. I can't stop them from going to heaven, but I can make them completely ineffective and useful to God. How does he do that? All kinds of ways. And we're going to see all these tactics, all these attacks, all these things to cause the children of Israel to be out of sorts, if you will, where they can't really be used by the Lord. So we're going to see the enemy really working through Pharaoh and through the Egyptian people. But in reality, it's Satan himself behind the scenes attacking and persecuting the people of God. Satan doesn't like God winning. He's the enemy of faith, after all. Satan wants to stop people hearing about salvation in Jesus, and if they do give their lives to Christ, he still gets in the way of growth. But this isn't a new phenomenon. This enemy has been on the warpath from the very beginning. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark is continuing his introduction of the book of Exodus today, a book that details how the people of Israel have run right up against Satan. They are God's people, so Satan continues to push against their ability to thrive. But Pastor Mark will remind you that God's greater. In fact, God will always be greater than Satan and will always be victorious in the end. With that, turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 1 as Pastor Mark continues his message, Satan's Persecution of God's People. Once the time was right, God called them out, delivered them from the slavery and oppression, and is going to lead them back again to the promised land. And of course, we'll see that here throughout the book of Exodus, especially toward the end when they finally get there. It's kind of a long journey. And uh, you're going to have a real heart for Moses, too, by the time this is done. A guy that didn't really start his ministry until he was 80. And the whole time, he had a huge church that was rebellious. Now, how would you like that to be your call? God called him to be the pastor of a rebellious church starting at 80 and going for 40 years. And then after all that wilderness rebellion, he finally gets to the promised land and God just lets him see it but doesn't let him go in because then Moses blew it. So in one way it seems very tragic, but there's a whole picture that God's painting here that we're going to see as we go through this book. Now the writer of the book was Moses. Obviously the Lord wrote it. But Moses, the Bible tells us, was the one who penned the book of Exodus as well as the other uh, first five books of the Bible. And although we can't be sure about which Pharaoh was really the leader at this time. Some say they're sure. Others will dispute that. It looks like it probably was a man by the name of Amenhotep II, who was what was called one of the Hyksos leaders of Egypt. Now, who were the Hyksos? They were an interesting group. They weren't really Egyptians. They were actually from the Semitic line, which Semitic is Jewish. So there was a season in Egypt's history where there were some leaders that came down from Assyria, actually came into power down in Egypt, and they were called the Hyksos leaders. And it's during this time that most scholars believe that the Jews were there in Egypt during this time, which is interesting because all those these rulers came from the same Semitic background. As far as that goes, they were not very nice to the Jews. And again, as we'll see here, they weren't friendly at all. They made them slaves and, and abused them. Now, in chapter 1, we're going to see this theme develop concerning the persecution of God's people by the enemy. Now, here's, here's a principle And again, I know it's a longer introduction, but you need it when you start a new book. But there's a principle here, and that is when we're going to see lots of principles about the Christian life as we work through Exodus. But when you give your life to Christ, here's one thing the enemy knows. He lost. He no longer has a chance to drag your soul down to hell with him. He's lost. However, he hasn't given up. And what that means is now he's going to shift tactics. His first tactic is do everything I can to get them from coming to Christ. Stop that from happening. Okay, they did it. Too late. What's plan number two? All right, I can't stop them from coming to Christ. I can't stop them from going to heaven, but I can make them completely ineffective and useful to God. 
How does he do that? All kinds of ways. And we're going to see all these tactics, all these attacks, all these things to cause the children of Israel to be out of sorts, if you will, where they can't really be used by the Lord. So we're going to see the enemy really working through Pharaoh and through the Egyptian people. But in reality, it's Satan himself behind the scenes attacking and persecuting the people of God. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But against powers and principalities in heavenly places. So although Pharaoh's in place, although Pharaoh's people are in place, it's really the enemy doing it. And why is that important? Because that's exactly what we face today, guys. It's no different. It's not a political leader who is anti-Christian that we're against. It's not somebody in power that doesn't like the church or whatever. You can go down the list of things in governments throughout America, in different areas of government. That's not, they're not the enemy. They're being used by the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. He's going to use these guys to attack the children of God. And things don't change much, do they? It's still exactly the same today. It's exactly the same. And this is where we have to put on our spiritual glasses and see with a broader brush stroke and see from the heavenly viewpoint what's going on. The enemy is the one that's behind all this, even the things that are happening in America today. And we're going to see a lot of parallels to our nation today. Now, with Israel, there was a double motive for the enemy. Understand this. There wasn't just let's immobilize them so they're not useful to the Lord, but it was also a hatred for the nation of Israel because God made promises to Abraham and his descendants. So anything that God has promised, Satan will fight against. So you got this double whammy going on with the nation of Israel. You know, Satan hates them because God loves them. And also he's trying to keep them immobile to be used by the Lord, especially during the time when they were walking with the Lord. They're not now, but when they were as a nation, so they're not being useful to the Lord. And we see the same thing today. I mean, look at Israel today. They're still the most persecuted nation in world history. Why? Because Satan hates them. And he knows that God's made promises to them. I think one of the greatest proofs that God's not done with the nation of Israel is how poorly they're treated even still today. I mean, why do you think they're so picked on? Because Satan hates them. He's picking on them. And so uh, we're going to see that as well as we go through here. And just watching his extra hatred toward them, if you will. We'll see the whole picture develop here of, of God's faithfulness to the nation and God's faithfulness to the believer uh, as they come into the kingdom of God. Now, it's interesting. We talk about the law here. We're going to see the law in this, you know, and we talked about Moses traveling through the wilderness. Some of you might be thinking, why did Moses, why did God have Moses, this faithful man of God, spend 40 years with a bunch of grumblers and complainers, fight with them the whole time, all the way through the wilderness, finally get them to the promised land, and then God says, now you can't go in, Moses. Why would God do that? Now we know that Moses blew it. We know that. We go back to that, amen. Moses, you did good all those years. And you blew it at the very end. So I understand that. And some of you might be thinking, that's awfully harsh. Why would God do that? But understand, it wasn't just God disciplining Moses. It was God giving us a picture of how he deals with us and how God is going to use the law in relation to Jesus Christ on the cross. What do I mean by that? Isn't it interesting that the law today cannot get you into the kingdom? Moses was the representative of the law, and the law could only get them as far as what? The promised land. But the law could not get them into the promised land. So God had to stop Moses from going into the promised land to paint the picture. The law can't do it. The law will never get you into the promised land. You can't get in by the law. The law can take you all the way to the edge. And that is it can show you you're a sinner. It can show you that you need to repent. It can show you that you need you know, God. But only Jesus Christ can grab your hand on this side of the wilderness and bring you into the promised land. He's the only one that can do it. And so there's a whole picture that God was painting of the fact that the law cannot get you into the promised land. And that really struck home to me this past week because I ran into a Seventh-day Adventist. And this was an older guy who had been steeped in Seventh-day Adventism, and you know he's been hardened in that Seventh-day Adventism, and was convinced that the law was the way to go and that everything else was wrong with the law. And I thought, how sad, because this is a man that I can tell you right now, he's living in the wilderness. He's lived in the wilderness his whole life, and he's never going to get to experience the promised land unless he lets Moses die and takes the hand of Joshua. By the way, what does Joshua translate into? Jesus. Jesus' name is Joshua. Yahshua. That is Jesus. And so you have the whole picture of the law getting right up to the promised land, then Yahshua, Jesus, taking them on into the promised land and setting them free. And so the whole picture is there that God gives us in Scripture. It's great. I love it. So a little bit of background on Exodus. Let's jump into it. Notice chapter 1, verse 1. He says, These are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man in his household came with Jacob, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and all those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. 
and Joseph died and his brothers and that generation. Now that's a huge statement. That's not just informational. The Holy Spirit is now painting a picture here that the tide is turning. There was a period of favor for the founders of the nation of Israel because they founded it on God. But as the founders died out, a new generation began to rise up around them that didn't know this God, didn't believe in this God. And now we're going to see the whole tenure of the nation change and the judgment of God begin to come in. So note that. This is an important transition here, even in just the first six verses. But note this, verse 7, but the children of Israel were fruitful. They increased abundantly. They multiplied. They grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Notice all the adjectives in verse 7. They were fruitful. They increased abundantly, exceedingly mightily, filled the land. God is making a point, isn't he? He blessed them. God is building a nation, quite literally. They're growing. They're, they're exploding as a nation. They were fruitful. They multiplied. Interesting, the word there means to team or to swarm. Think about that. You think about teaming. You think about all these fish. You ever seen these just piles of little fish that, you know, that just, they're just everywhere? You know, you see them on these specials about the ocean. There's just piles of fish teeming. Or maybe you've been in the water and had piles of fish team around you or whatever. It's a pretty awesome uh, sight to see. Or maybe a, hopefully you haven't seen a swarm of bees up close doing this. But maybe swarmed by other things, you know, this kind of thing. That's what it says they were like. They were just everywhere. Now imagine the Egyptians seeing that. Like, these guys are all over the place. They're growing like crazy. They're everywhere, and we're being swarmed by them. And now you see how they begin to get nervous because, again, they're the world, that picture of the world, and the picture of the church, if you will, God's people. And so there's this tension beginning to build here as these two different people groups are growing in strength and shows God, again, being faithful to his people because he said, Abraham, I'm going to multiply you like the sand of the sea. He said, remember, you look up at the stars, Abraham. He said, see them? He said, can you count them? He said, that's what your people are going to be like. I'm going to just multiply you exceedingly. So we see God be faithful to his word, which he always is. But again, this just really accentuates the story of the Jew because God has been faithful to them throughout their history, not because they were good. Note this, guys, this is so important. God has not been faithful to the Jew because they were good. Now, they've had good generations and good seasons as a nation throughout history, but they've also had a lot of bad ones, haven't they? And yet even through all their bad ones, God has been faithful. And God is still faithful to the nation of Israel today. Even today, he's still faithful to them, and yet do they love him today? They don't love him. They don't even know him. They're really blasphemous. They're denying their only hope of salvation. They're very Christ. They're denying today. Now, we love them because they're future brothers. The Bible tells us that. They're future brothers and sisters. So we know that many of them are going to be saved, and God has kept his promise to them, is going to keep his promise to them. But again, it wasn't because they were good. It's because God is good. And this encourages me. Because it shows me that God is faithful to his promises, you know, even sometimes when we're not. Doesn't that encourage you? Have you had times you've not been faithful? I have. And yet God remains faithful. That's exciting, isn't it? Because, you know, God spanks us. He brings us back. But God is faithful. God's promises are, are yes and amen. The, you know, the, the, the promises of God, they're irrevocable, he says. And I love that about our God. He keeps his word. So that's encouraging for us. And he's kept his word to the nation of Israel. And now notice we saw this kind of ominous verse in 6 when that generation died and time goes by. And this verse is another pivotal verse in these first 14 that we're looking at and really pivotal to the whole book of Exodus, these first few chapters. And that is verse 8. This is huge. Notice what it says. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now that can sound like a simple statement until you think about it. This is a very telling statement. It was not simply they didn't know Joseph. It's really a point he's making here. In saying that he didn't know Joseph, he didn't know Joseph's God, and he didn't know all that God had done through Joseph and the Jews for the nation of Egypt. Note that. In other words, there was a generation that had founded this new nation, and they founded it on God. And then as they began to grow, the people around them that didn't want that God and didn't want that direction, a new generation arose that didn't know about their God, didn't know about how, the, how they had been used to bless that nation, and now they're going to begin to turn on them. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Guys, look at our nation. Look at America. I, when I read this, I can't help but have America jump off the pages to me. Why? We were founded as a nation by Christians who loved the Lord and built our nation off the word of God and all these things. And God blessed our nation. Why? Because of our founding fathers. The reason we're blessed today is because we had a group of men that got together and said, we're going to put together a constitution that's based on God. And we're going to put together, you know, a, even the same structure out of Isaiah. 
the whole king and, and the whole way that it's lined out, the, the king, the lawgiver and all this, that's how we got our Congress and our Supreme Court and, and all these, our branches of government were based off of Isaiah. So our founding fathers understood that if we wanted to have a successful nation and a nation that would be blessed, it needed to be based on the things of God and the word of God. And they did that and the nation was blessed. But guys, this is what's ominous to me because how sad it is when a nation forgets what God and his people have done for them. And I'm afraid that's where we are today. As a matter of fact, there are people who will say that the problem with America is, guess what? You guys, you're the problem. I actually had somebody tell me that. Now, had it just been me, I might have agreed. You know, if they said, Mark, you're the problem, I said, well, you may have a point. But they weren't talking about me. They said, you Christians, you're the reason America's going under. Wow. You see, a new generation arose that didn't know Joseph. The generation that knows God and his people sees the blessing of God that comes upon a nation and upon a people because of God. A people that doesn't know that, there becomes a distance, a bitterness, a separation, and a struggle against each other. And that's what we're seeing develop here. We're seeing this generation here that was raised up in Egypt that did not know Joseph. They didn't know the believers. They didn't know the children of God. They had forgotten that it was a believer, Joseph, that God gave the interpretation of the Pharaoh's dream about what was going to happen to the nation. God spoke prophetically through Joseph and said, you better put some grain away because the nation is going to be in a famine for seven years. And Pharaoh knew that it was God because it was supernatural. And so they put away all this grain and Joseph had all this wisdom and they prepared the nation. The nation survived survive it. Look, if it had not been for the Christians, and I'm going to call them Christians. I know Jesus wasn't born yet. I know they didn't call them Christians. But for, for our understanding's sake, the believers of that day, it was because of the Christians, to use modern day vernacular, the believers in God, that the nation of Egypt not only was blessed, but survived. Had it not been for God using Joseph and the Jews, Egypt would have been destroyed. How many of you guys saw that big dust cloud that poured over uh, Arizona this last couple of days? Anybody see that on the news? It was a scary sight, wasn't it? That was an awesome sight. There's this huge dust cloud. I think it was something like 15 miles long, and I don't know how deep, and it was just this wall of dust that went thousands of feet up in the air and just, you know, just was sweeping across, uh, coming from Tucson up toward you know, Phoenix, and it was just a big blanket of dust in its path. It was unbelievable. It literally had a beginning. It was a big wall you could see moving, and it covered this whole area. You know what I'm thinking? That's what it must have been like during the famine during the days of Joseph. And it was nationwide that way. And had they not prepared, the nation would have starved to death. They would have died. Or they would have had to leave and go somewhere else. It wouldn't have been a nation. That was because of the children of God that that nation survived. God used them to be a blessing to that nation. If it hadn't been for this ancient Christian, if you will, Egypt wouldn't even have existed any longer. Yet now it says this new Pharaoh arose that did not know Joseph. And again, he had no fear of God. He had no respect for God or for the God of Joseph and actually saw them as a threat. Rather than seeing them as a blessing to the nation which God had used them, now they're the bad guy. Do you see that happening a little bit in our nation today? Rather than the Christian being seen as the reason America's blessed, guys, we're the bad guy. We're the ones causing the problem. We're not tolerant enough. We're not going along with the sin of Egypt around us. We're speaking out against it, and because of that, we're bigoted, or we're narrow-minded, or we're, we're haters, whatever word you might want to use. That's what's happening, and what's, what's really amazing is, is, again, you talk about seeing history repeat itself. It's because the enemy uses the same tactic over and over. This is not something that's new here. I guess if you wanted to put this again in modern day vernacular, you could say it this way. A new president came along who did not have favor toward the Christians. That would be a modern day translation. A new president, a new pharaoh, he was their president who didn't know. And I say that so we can associate. It's hard for us to think about a pharaoh. But it's like having a president put in place that doesn't really have favor toward the Christians and doesn't really like them and starts making their life hard. And then over time it gets worse and worse and worse, and finally the Christians begin to cry out to God and say, God, you got to rescue us. And the exciting thing to me about this kind of story is God does. God begins to rescue. When the Christians begin to cry out, God rescues them. He delivers them. And we're going to see that again uh, as God delivers them you know, out of the nation of, of Egypt here. And again, a huge lesson for us in this, guys, because note this. This is amazing to me. All it takes is one generation to pass without passing the torch on of God to our kids for a Pharaoh to raise up that doesn't know Joseph. That's scary. It's scary. You can forget that quick. Why are we blessed? What happened to our nation? Why was it the very first session of Congress there was a three-hour prayer meeting to start it? The first session of Congress. It was either three or four hours. I don't remember. It may have been longer, but that's how they started Congress. 
Today, they're passing laws. You, you almost can't even say the name Jesus when you're praying at some of the government things. Why? Because there's a new Pharaoh. There's a new generation that doesn't know Joseph. I don't know Joseph. Who's Billy Graham? He's some old guy that's about to die. And didn't he do some kind of crusade or something? Oh, yeah, what, weren't the crusades when the Christians did bad things to the Muslims? I'm not sure what that's all about, but he's just some old guy. And the problem is the Joseph of our generation is about to die. And this new generation doesn't really know Joseph. And I see a tide turning in our nation. It doesn't mean that God can't send revival. It won't. We need to be praying for that. But when I see how what happened here with the nation of Egypt and how it only takes really a generation to forget Joseph, guys, we need to be training up the next generation about the Lord, don't we? Our kids, everybody around us, we need to be raising them up because when you get pharaohs in who don't know the God of Joseph, they begin to oppress the Christians, and that's happening in our nation. I hate to say it, it's happening. We used to be the ones that had the favor. We used to be the ones that, oh, you're a Christian. Wow. Now it's, oh, you're a Christian. There's the troublemaker. Remember Ahab and how it was in the days of Ahab when he runs into Elijah? First thing Ahab says to Elijah, oh, there you are, troubler of Israel. Wait a minute. Who was the one that was a blessing to Israel? It was Elijah. Who was the troubler of Israel? Ahab. And yet here's Ahab telling the blessed of God, he's the troubler of Israel. We've got it going on in our nation right now. We're the reason our nation has not been judged already. I'm convinced of that. It's because of you guys in this room that America's even around. And it's because we've stood with Israel that we're around. And that's changing, isn't it? Did you know that we just listed Israel as a terrorist nation? Our government, our leadership just listed Israel as the first time in America's history. Israel, a terrorist nation that's help, that listed them as helping terrorists. Guys, we have a pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. So this book is very, very appropriate to the day in which we live. So I think God's going to use it in a special way, and I think God's going to use it to warn us. I think God's going to use it to prepare us. I think God's going to use it to get us to pray, and we need to be praying for our nation so our nation would be you know, raised up again. God can restore this, and God will restore it because God is faithful. And what's interesting here, again, when you have a pharaoh or a nation that doesn't know Joseph, rather than being grateful for what God has done through the Christian community, they begin to see them as the problem. How can we deal with them? What laws can we pass to squelch them? How can we paint a picture of them that will make the rest of society reject them and not like them? And you're going to see Pharaoh do that. Satan's going to pull all the stops out. But remember, it's not Pharaoh. Who's, it's who is above him, right? It's how he's being used. So by not knowing Joseph, this believer, again, it really, who they really were, what they did, it brings a trouble and, and problems for the nation. It's interesting here that Pharaoh, it says, was afraid of the people of God. Notice it, he was afraid of the people of God because they were too numerous. You know, it says there, he's worried about them. They're getting too numerous. He didn't know Joseph. Look at verse 9. He said, the, the people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So he's afraid of them. And that's interesting because although they may not like Christians oftentimes, those in leadership, they know there's something there. There's some power to that. And notice he gives uh, the reason for that. He says, come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happen in the event of war that they join our enemies and they fight against us. And so they go up out of the land. In other words, they fight against our position, our power, and we lose power. You know, and then they might even fight against the enemy and, and then actually leave the land. So we're going to lose their slavery. So again, they were using them as slaves at that time. So they're worried if war breaks out, as well as the slave labor uh, that they had uh, with the nation of Israel. It's just amazing to me when I think about the, the parallels here. Because Christianity being such a foundation of our national beginning and our heritage, the only way Satan can control, subdue the Christian community is to pass laws to force us to be quieter. While our time at the table of God's Word is ending for today, please keep reading in the book of Exodus. There's so much to discover and appreciate about God and His awesome power. So much of this book touches on God's redemption for His people. His love and care for them is what compels him to do unheard acts to prove that he's for them and is there to rescue them. What a caring, loving God to go to such great measures to look out for his people. He has the same care and concern for you as well, and he wants to be your rescue. If you're unsure if you need to be rescued, we encourage you to hop over to thewaymedia.net and ask us any questions you have. Find the Come to the Table link, and then there's a form under Questions and Comments. Again, that's thewaymedia.net. 
You can also hear this message again at thewaymedia.net or download the Way Media app so you know when new broadcasts are happening. On behalf of Pastor Mark, we appreciate your prayers during this study through Exodus. Although this is an Old Testament book of historical accounts, there's so much to gain about the nature of God and His unrelenting loyalty to His people. We hope this overarching message is conveyed through Pastor Mark's teachings. We appreciate your prayers for this ministry as the Word of God goes forth to many who might not have heard it otherwise. Pastor Mark has more to share through the book of Exodus So we hope you'll be able to join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.